a Southern Nevada focus on the future, featuring Steve Hill, the CEO and president of the Las Vegas Convention and Visitors Authority. Uh, Steve's got a very long bio here. I won't read all of it to you, but I'll hit some of the highlights of some of the things he's working on right now. Uh, under Mr. Hill's leadership, the Las Vegas Convention and Visitors Authority is currently undergoing a $980 million expansion as well as development of the Convention Center Loop, a first of its kind underground transportation system in partnership with Elon Musk's Boring Company, which will whisk convention attendees throughout the 200 acre campus in less than two minutes. The Convenient Center expansion scheduled to debut in January will add 1.4 million additional square feet of exhibition and meeting space to the existing campus for a total of 4.6 million square feet throughout the facility. Uh, from with that, let's hear from Mr. Steve Hill. Thanks, Nathan. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with everybody. Had told me that uh, normally in this time you would uh, have an economist, and he thought uh, hearing from me might uh, a different level of insight. Um, actually, beating an economist uh, in the half an hour seemed uh, hard to overcome. So I. Uh, I agreed to, and that, Tom, thanks for thanks for the invite. Pleasure to be back with uh, everybody in the industry. Um, it's been long enough that we ought to mention that uh, the first third years of my career I spent in the concrete industry in the red business, uh, six in Dayton, Ohio, and then uh, the last twenty four in Vegas. I moved to Vegas in uh, nineteen eighty. Uh, that's a pretty good. 24-year stretch to be in the concrete industry here, uh, and the, the industry has been great to me and my family, and it's a pleasure to be back with everybody. Um, I'm going to cover uh, topics this morning. I'm going to talk uh, about economic development, economy, and how to think about the economy in Southern Nevada. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what we see in the future here. Uh, trying to predict that is a very difficult thing to do, um, but I think we can at least understand uh, what the trajectory will look like and what will be the triggers for that. Uh, I mean, is still a little murky. Um, and with vaccines, that's uh, become a little more clear just over the past week or so. Um, and I want to talk about the Boring Company and not only the project here at the Convention Center, um, but what we're working on. It hopefully into the over time. Um, I think it's exciting, I, uh, like everybody in the audience, an understanding of really what that is and uh, what it could mean to the destination. Um, a little bit. Um, that uh, is really around bringing money from outside of the region that you're talking about, whether it's the state of Nevada, Clark County, the Reno Parks area, into and the we, we tend to split in the economic development field um, the uh, in we call primary companies which bring money from outside of the state into the state or out of the region in the region um, uh, and the service industries are regions because those are there. Those primary companies drive the size of the economy, they drive, drive the growth of the economy, and the service companies come because companies will need the service industry support. Um, about um, maybe a little less are um, primary jobs that are um, selling either what they're producing, they provide to somebody outside of the region, um, a little uh, our service uh, industry jobs. Um, that's a little simplistic. Um, um, in most economies, and for example, in Southern Nevada, uh, from a healthcare industry standpoint, in particular, a decade ago, we had about 65% of what we would expect uh, in our service industry in Southern Nevada. And um, over 
Mexico primarily because um, agreed to expand Medicaid, brought a billion and a half dollars of federal money into um, Nevada, a large port of Nevada. And we have closed by at 65 We're now to 83 We typically a um, that an exception to that, for example, would be the pharmaceutical industry, uh, which is exporting money into the region. And but most of that industry is to services uh, for local. Um, and Northern Nevada, and particularly people who are leading the region, adding what and that caused a 35,000 job gap. Uh, what you would expect a decade ago, uh, the gap has been cut uh, in half over the last decade. And it's a part of the economy, even though it is not others to stop. Um, so, Megan, if you could open the slide deck, we'll take a look at um, what the segment is in Nevada. And you can see that, uh, not surprisingly, the leisure and hospitality industry is the dominant industry. And that is a primary. While we're not shipping a product, uh, we are attracting through tourism money from out of It is the main driver of me, and uh, so nobody is surprised by that. Is a big portion of the primary jobs. The diversifying economy in Nevada, uh, what we need to do is grow other primary industries um, in order to help balance uh, the 29% of the leisure and hospitality sector. A lot of those primary jobs can be found um, often in trade and transportation. Uh, that's um, Largely driven from a job standpoint here by distribution facilities that distribute product not only into the Clark County region, but also primarily into Southern California. Uh, you can also find it um, in manufacturing, and our manufacturing is obviously very low. Uh, average for manufacturing is 8%. Uh, getting that number up through an economic development effort um, would be really beneficial uh, in helping to diversify uh, the economy in Southern Nevada. Uh, you can see construction here at 8%. Uh, the national average is four and a half. And if you look at the next slide, uh, you can see the progress uh, that the uh, made in lowering it, uh, the dependence on leisure and hospitality. Uh, it has dropped from nearly 20 or 35 percent uh, 30, 25 years ago uh, down to the 29 percent number that you see today, uh, which is a pretty significant drop in progress. Um, the, the dip that you see in the, the last decade uh, is really reflect not so much of diversifying data of the construction bubble that we all went through. The construction employment number during that period of time peaked 12% uh, in Southern Nevada, which is really an unhealthy level. Uh, the construction industry um, certainly builds growth and in a market that is going to be in that 5% national average um, and our eight and a half eight now um, is a pretty healthy number but when it, uh, we are typically overbuilding uh, as we did during the last decade and you feel the results of that when you know what we saw is a bubble bursting uh, 15 years ago and if nothing else a slowdown uh, in construction I mean, you get ahead uh, in the construction cycle ahead of how quickly the economy is actually growing to keep up with it. 
One of the things uh, is uh, that the housing industry got way ahead of its 2005, six, seven. Uh, we built uh, at a peak housing units during that period of time. Uh, we dropped uh, there about. Uh, it's a pretty easy set of statistics to understand, and I'm sure most of you do. There's about 2.3 households, and with two, two and a half percent growth in Las Vegas uh, at 2.3 people, you're going to need typically a thousand housing units a year uh, to keep up with the demand in the economy. We built a year excess supply, and frankly, still haven't uh, fully. That situation is different, obviously, in particularly because uh, the introduction of the Gigafactory really high job growth uh, in the region over the past five or six years. Housing has been in very short supply during the bubble three years ago. The thousand units a year. Uh, it's only recently recovered to the that has created a housing shortage in that area. So, and situation uh, to exist. And on the next slide, you see how strongly Las Vegas depends uh, on tourism and hospitality, how much it drives the economy uh, in this region as compared to other cities. Um, Orlando is obviously our biggest competitor uh, in terms of means of convention. It's also the city that is second for reliance on tourism. And then it drops off significantly from there. The number that you see uh, with some of the cities at the tail of this graph, the national average, 10% of the economy in the United States. And obviously, Las Vegas is nearly um, three times. We'll start to talk a little bit about um, the recovery in the Las Vegas area. When we shut down, uh, we lost uh, nearly 50% of the jobs in the quality area. Since we've reopened, uh, we've um, recalled about half of those lost jobs. A great correlation, but certainly between uh, the number of rooms up, the occupancy levels would still hover in that 45, 50% range for occupancy. Um, about 80% of the hotel rooms are open, and that's a, uh, a pretty relation uh, that the industry has available. Um, at the top of that chart, you can see what the impact of the Great Recession was and what the recovery looked like. And get a vaccine that is rolled out. The patient is that we will uh, to that recession uh, type uh, employment area start to follow a line that is more consistent uh, with a general uh, rather than a health crisis. We need to get the health crisis behind us and on recovering uh, from the significant economic that that health crisis costs. What happens with a stimulus package is going to make uh, a big difference in how quick that will happen. The massive stimulus that uh, the federal government put into place during right around the time of Las Vegas was exceptionally helpful not only to individuals who uh, saw unemployment checks jump from that they normally would have gotten in Nevada uh, to about a thousand and sixty uh, with that six hundred. Uh, in addition to that, uh, many people, most people, saw a uh, one-time payment of twelve hundred dollars. Uh, 
um, that really helped bridge that initial shutdown period. Of, but that's obviously expired. A lot of people uh, of the end of their unemployment. That combined with no act, no action right now by the federal government on a stimulus uh, could make the recovery from an economic standpoint much more lengthy. Um, the uh, stimulus comes that can help bridge uh, what is a gap uh, in this uh, recovery. On the next slide, you can see what the typically looks at in terms of its health. Um, room nights occupied is not something we really look at, uh, but in this case, because 82% of the rooms that lock, uh, be open for occupancy, um, we've dropped from about 150,000 rooms likely available down to about 125,000 rooms that are available. So the occupancy rate that we based on available rooms, so we want uh, that the occupancy is down uh, 42%. Uh, it typically in uh, Las Vegas runs uh, between 80 to 88, about uh, 90%. An average or AER uh, is that. So those things are basically multiplied uh, against each other. It, a, a room tax or a revenue to uh, the, the hotels uh, and the resorts uh, being down uh, more than 50%. Uh, September and October is probably slightly than that. And as we get into That'll probably be a bit more. Um, average room rates ADR is typically uh, in the $130. Those numbers may look at is, um, the outlook for in the leisure and hospitality industry in Las Vegas moving forward. Um, in order to make projects pencil, um, and each the cost of a property uh, per day. You can see it is one of the properties that uh, will open soon. It's about 4.3 billion. They'll have um, a little less than 4,000 rooms available. It's about $1.2 million per room. In order to make that make sense for somebody, you have to get back to that 87% occupancy and back to the $130 or so room night and goes with that uh, in order to make a project like that make sense. And investors are to consider moving forward additional growth in the destination back to those uh, normal numbers to drive growth in Las Vegas. The, the Fountain Blue uh, has been in built state for years. Uh, and there's been a lot of conversation about whether that project makes sense moving forward. Um, I do think it does. Uh, the transaction was for $600 million. Uh, there's nearly four rooms in that. So it's been invested in what's there so far. Construction. So you could probably get that property back up and running for around 750000 per room. And that thing, at some point, as long as that structure doesn't sit there too long, to be able to uh, really recover from that uh, extent. With slides uh, pretty quickly. Um, I think most of you know the projects that are being built uh, in Southern Nevada. Um, there's been a big expansion of meeting and convention space. That industry is exceptionally important. 
uh, of Las Vegas. Um, it nearly 20% of the visit, significantly more of the spend. Those who come for means and intent, budgets when they're here, uh, room rates rise, shows. The process of adding three and a half million uh, of convention and meeting space uh, that's on top of 11 and a half million square feet that's already here. And put that in perspective, three and a half million built is more than that. Oh, all but five other we have. On the next slide, uh, just a picture of the center. That's 750,000 uh, square feet. Of that feet. Um, we measure that in terms of the convention center extension is really a 1.0 square feet of building but there will be 750,000 leasable square feet. That building will be done, um, but it won't be, uh, and we can show back, uh, right now looks like uh, probably April. Uh, just uh, some of the other projects that uh, are being built will be key to bringing Las Vegas back, helping, uh, the city um, that includes Circa, which just opened last month. Uh, it's an exciting property, really be driver of what happened. Uh, um, will open again in this in January, and the sphere uh, to be in construction uh, in, in 2023. This will be a one of a uh, seats 18,000 people in a very interactive and cutting edge way, and it'll really be a driver um, and bring Las Vegas back. Megan, I think you can probably move two slides ahead. Um, and opened uh, in September. Uh, we're all disappointed that uh, Walmart, we all, but the stadium is going to be a real driver uh, of the future of Las Vegas. Uh, sports will be a real driver of the future of Las Vegas. Uh, we're certainly hoping to all be able to attend um, the opening of the uh, trajectory that seems possible at this point, but this is a venue that Vegas to really fill the only hole. Uh, um, it allows the largest types of events to be in Las Vegas now. Events of this size can really make weekends, make weeks, uh, drive uh, attendance, destination, destination. Um, over the next decade, we will host a Super Bowl. We will host a Final Four. Uh, those types of events be uh, a, a real draw uh, for the return of uh, visitation uh, in Las Vegas. So I'm going to close by talking about, Megan, you can move forward another slide, talking about the Boring Company uh, project a little bit. Um, as um, and we probably are nearing completion of uh, the construction of the system here on campus uh, at the uh, um, first out of the other through the buildings, about a mile and a half walk. Did not work. Uh, these, the work company's project um, was the to solve that situation for us to build project um, to exhibit what can happen in the resort corridor and certainly for the boring company uh, around the country and around the globe. Um, the uh, tunnel system, the main tunnel system, um, board with a perimeter to concrete lined interior that leaves a 12 tunnel. Uh, the crowd, uh, the roadway, 42 feet 
uh, below the surface as a uh, table in spots. Uh, the tunnel at the convention center is actually below the water. Um, the tunnel is a sealed system and um, functions very well by the water table. And it is simply which um, the system will run uh, Tesla's uh, um, threes, model X's, and uh, move between three stations. So, Megan, if you could move to the uh, next slide. Then the station, the convention center, uh, either end um, will be uh, above ground. Uh, the one in the middle is actually a pretty spectacular station. Um, will be if any. Uh, but we needed one here. We also want to it can take place if you want to build a station uh, below ground. Above ground um, really look like uh, a pick station. We have solar shades for that station. The cars just come out of a ramp in a tunnel, uh, drive around uh, in a drop people off, pick people up, go back through a, a ramp. And what you see up now uh, is what committed for the system on in the resort corridor. Uh, the system will run from the Fremont Street area uh, down Las Vegas Boulevard and Main Street um, from the stratosphere south um, on and really under properties, whatever they don't. This tunnel further apart than the lanes um, on Las Vegas Boulevard, um, and I'll show you on the next slide the reason for that. And then as you get to the south end near Tropicana, off, um, go uh, picks up, uh, or actually Flamingo picks up, resorts on Flamingo, loops around to the and then to the east heads over to the airport and three. Um, okay, the next slide and the last slide, I've kind of blown this up so it's a little bit easier um, between what has been submitted in the city of Las Vegas, which is north of Sahara, submitted uh, in Clark County, which is south of Sahara. And you, if you can look closely, you see some kind of pink lines uh, between the main, so what those represent are really what amounts to underground traffic circles. So the tunnels obviously are one way, uh, the east tunnel moving tunnel moving south. You drive all the way around the system. There are really traffic circles on uh, the main tunnels. So you get uh, at the wind. You have to go north for a little while, but you'll hit a traffic a turnaround, a U where you can turn around and then go south if the intention was to go to the Bellagio from when the, the city of Las Vegas was approved at the planning commission. Um, uh, we anticipate that the system in Clark County will be before the county commission here in December or January, and we hope to move forward uh, very quickly. Uh, point of funding standpoint, uh, the boring company is fun. the tunnel system itself, the properties on station for their stations, um, and they again they can be um, pretty straightforward. It's coming out of the ground uh, that connects to potentially a port of cashier or a parking garage or a parking lot, um, or you can build a structure over it if the property choose to do so. See all those dots where we anticipate uh, stations to be. The 
land use permit, obviously, be submitted and approved by all of those proper already taken place as part of that submittal. Um, so this may not be exactly where they are depicted. Uh, they're anticipated to be in the vicinity of each one of those dots and all of those uh, properties. The typically like an Uber, uh, have an app on your phone. Uh, if you're at the convention center, stadium, just plug that into your phone. The Tesla will come on with a sign that stadium. It is the name. You don't have to stop at stations along the way. It really looks like a highway system where there are off ramps from the main tunnel to the station and those ramps up to the surface and then the ramp back down into the main station. So a trip from the convention center, for example, to the stadium would be about four or five minutes. A trip from the airport to say Circa downtown uh, would be about nine minutes. Um, and with that, Nathan, Tom, I will stop and answer any questions. And if not, uh, happy to uh, just say thank you for the opportunity. It's a pleasure to be back with the industry. That was really fantastic, Steve. I'm really looking forward to this system uh, getting opened up. That's going to be an exciting ride. Uh, Shoot, I could picture myself riding around on it just to enjoy it. <laughs> uh, I don't see any questions over in the Q&A, so I, I'll take that to mean you've done a fantastic job explaining it all. So uh, with that, Steve, I'll, I'll thank you, and uh, we'll move on to our next presentation. Oh, what's this? I did see something pop up in the Q&A. Somebody must have had a tickler. Ah, the question from Tom Teets. Are the Teslas autonomous? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, they will, will start with the system being driven, uh, so they will have drivers. Uh, the goal is to become both, and I'm separating this a little bit, driverless and then autonomous. Um, in the asphalt, there are uh, a series of conduits with electrical wiring running through those conduits. And the, that wiring uh, emits a radio frequency. And so the cars will, individual cars will tie in to an individual radio frequency, and that radio frequency uh, will allow that car to initially be driverless but guided. So it's kind of like a, um, a virtual slot machine or slot car, um, where it'll be programmed. The car will be programmed into that frequency, and the frequency will drag that car around to where it needs to go, know where all the other cars are in the system. Now, that will incorporate the um, autonomous technology that is already in Teslas. Uh, so that will augment that guidance system. Um, and then over time, um, that guidance system uh, will go away and the system will be autonomous. Uh, for this to make financial sense, it needs to end up being driverless. Um, and we anticipate that happening um, relatively quickly here at the convention center. This is an environment that is probably the easiest autonomous or driverless environment that you can possibly create. There'll be no pedestrians other than uh, around the stations. There'll be no other cars in the system other than the cars that are designed to be in the system. So it's a, it's a great environment to introduce autonomy. Um, so we anticipate that happening uh, pretty quickly. Great, thank you. And then we've had a couple of uh, inquiries here uh, regarding whether or not they can get a copy of your PowerPoint. Oh, certainly, Me Megan's got it and she's um, welcome to make that available to, to anybody. Great, I think what we're planning to do is put the uh, the recordings of the sessions on the NIC website after we're concluded and we'll put this PowerPoint along with it so people can both uh, see you delivering the presentation, Steve, as well as download it for themselves. You know, I'd probably prefer the download, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I'm all about that. All right, thank you very much, Steve. Okay, uh, with, we're gonna move on to our next session, which is going to be 